Hello, everyone. So this is our last session of the day. Um, just before I go into that, I just want to let you know that Sundowners on the TikTok Terrace will be starting at five o'clock and that'll be running through to seven. Uh, and we've got a DJ out there for you as well. So don't forget to go and enjoy that afterwards and give yourself a nice big pat on the back for having a first day done and dusted. Um, so with our last session, inspiration and perspiration, the story of three affiliate founders. So I'm going to leave this one for all of you guys to introduce yourselves uh, and I'll see you later. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, Simon. You joining? Come back, Steve. All right. We, um, we have the pleasure of being the last panel of the day. Hopefully, we can be entertaining for you. Um, we've got three incredible entrepreneurs here on the stage. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and their business in a few words. Sabrina, you want to start? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm Sabrina. I'm the founder and CEO of Digidip, which is a um, premium private sub network. So yeah, we, I, 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 I actually started the business um, for the German publishers and then quickly internationalized to France, UK, US. So now we are global. And yeah, around three weeks ago, I sold the company. <laughs> And uh, now, yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> After eight years, you know, you can't imagine. <laughs> Wild ride. <laughs> yeah, happy to be here. Thank you for showing up. You'll definitely, I'll ask you some questions about that in a second. Yeah. Shri. Hi, guys. I'm giggling because I'm the old timer, but I see some fellow old timers in the crowd and that's making me laugh. I won't point because they'll probably feel that I'm being prejudiced and ageist, but hey. Um, so my name is Shri Sharma, I'm CEO and co-founder of Increasingly. Um, I've been an affiliate for a little while. Um, so I founded an MPI um, and then Incubator and then uh, sold and exited that business. And then most recently, uh, but that's still five years ago now, I launched Increasingly, which is a machine learning technology for the retail space with products on site in marketing and in store. Um, and it's a really, really exciting uh, business and it's been super cool. And that man there keeps calling me on my phone. <laughs> Rude. Stop calling him, please. Rude. <laughs> At least during the panel, please stop calling him. Um, so yeah, really good to be here. And uh, I think Shri, I mean, you qualify as a serial entrepreneur because that's, your, that's not your first rodeo. And we can talk about that as well. Kieran. Can you hear me? Good. Uh, I'm Kieran. Uh, I feel like I'm on blind date. And I'm not sure if Sri's more of an old timer than I am. I, I think I've been coming here since 2008. And you say you've been running it for eight years. I've been 13 years in now. Mm. Um, so Genie Ventures, I'm the CEO, founder of Genie Ventures. We've got three brands. We've got uh, Broadband Genie, which is broadband comparison website. Uh, Genie Shopping has a stand over there today, which is a, a CSS and Genie Goals, which is a digital marketing agency for retailers. And yeah, we've been going since about 2008. So I too see a lot of familiar faces out there from over the years. Hi, everyone. <laughs> and I'm Hanan. I'm the founder of Trackonomics, recently acquired by Impact, Trackonomics Woo! Impact. Um, and I think, um, so Trackonomics is a data aggregation an automation solution for publishers. Um, and I feel quite privileged to be here with these um, three individuals. You've all done very well um, in you know, a rather difficult space. Um, we don't have much time today to, you know, to ask all the questions that I would like to ask to you. But we'll, let's start with an obvious one, uh, which is um, what essentially drew you to start your own company? So actually, it was out of a out of my own issues you know i had i had my own blog and i had huge um trouble monetizing it took me just a lot of time to sign up to all the networks sign up to all the programs then i saw that there are solutions out there that are doing what digital is doing today but those were tailored to different markets not for germany so i thought okay um let's see if there's a german solution and then I looked around and I found some and I didn't like the way they, <laughs> you know, I didn't like the huge revenue share they took from me. 
<laughs> who were they, Sabrina? Yeah, Re yeah. To the crowd, who were they? I, they just acquired me, so. <laughs> so yeah, so you just gotta piss them off and then they'll acquire you. <laughs> Anyway, um, I spoke to a huge media group in uh, Germany, starts with an A, and, <laughs> and the guy, he was like, I told him, like, okay, I'm going to start this, I'm going to do this for um, the German market, and it's going to be premium, I don't, I won't, I, you know, I'm not going to pitch now, but um, would, you, would you be my first customer? And he said, yeah, it sounds amazing, I'll do it. So then I hired developers because I'm not a developer. And uh, it took a year until we launched the product because it took a year to develop it, right? So they weren't very good, the developers then? <laughs> it's a very complex platform, they told me. <laughs> and um, so fast forward, a year later, um, tried to call the guy. He didn't work there anymore and no one knew who I was. <laughs> and the next step basically was to go to the networks and the advertisers and uh, they all told me, well, we don't need another sub-network. Um, we won't work with you. And then I said, well, I can't stop because it took a year to develop. I have to, I have to sell this. No, this, this. I don't have a job. I don't have a proper job. You know, like I have to make this work. And uh, yeah, made sure I had some USPs that impressed them. And then eventually it worked. Yeah. I'm going to come back to the difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> Shri, same question to you. Like, you know, what made you think or sort of jump and say, I'm going to do my own thing. So this is going back a fair while. Um, if I'm honest, and it's good to be honest because everyone hears them the truth, not some BS story. I wanted to have financial independence. I didn't want to be kind of like worried in the future. And I wanted to know that I had, you know, I had money. I wanted that financial independence so that I could then choose what I wanted to do. And then from there, it, it moved and it changed because I've always enjoy building things and trying to be creative and so then the journey became how can I build things how can I make things and that's how it went through one company and you know I'm, I'm looking at Tim and he was part of that journey and we were just talking about that and we built stuff together and then from there building a brand new company was that creative expression of how do you take something take nothing and make something and that was just really a phenomenal experience um, and that's really what does it for me but being frank, initially it was about making some money. That's a good answer. Hmm. May I? Yeah, you stole my answer. Uh, money, obviously. Money and fun and excitement and all those other things. Um, so I started in 2004 was when I started my own business and in, in affiliate and it, there, there were just so many opportunities and I'm not qualified to say if there are, if it's still like that at the moment, but at the time, you know, you came to these events and it was full of people with upstairs bedroom businesses. Pretty, pretty full today. Yeah. I think, I think uh, I've heard today that they've sold uh, more tickets, PI Live, today than in pre-COVID. They've sold more tickets and yeah. for more money yeah, than pre-COVID, yeah. yeah? Well done, PI Live, well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, it kind of ran in my family as well though. So my, my dad ran a burglar alarm factory in Birmingham. My mum ran a, a lingerie shop on the edge of Coventry. Um, and this, uh, a couple of people have heard, probably heard me tell the story before, but I was walking to a football match in Coventry with my elder brother. And I was about 15 at the time and he was working for an electrical supplier in Birmingham and had what I thought was quite a good job. And he, he left and started his own business. And I said, why did you start your own business? And he said, because I'm fed up working for dickheads. So for all the genie people here, that's not a... Please don't follow Dickhead. that, that oh, advice. Oh, dickhead. Yeah. Okay. You know what I find really interesting? <laughs> okay. I think, um, so Sabrina and I, I think we both came from a background of essentially doing something and seeing, we, we didn't like the way that it worked and we wanted to, to make it better. Hmm. And you two seem to come from a background of like entrepreneurs in your family or essentially thinking about entrepreneurship as a, as a financial um, uh, move, essentially. I think, you know, we, I started... Uh, trackonomics originally because I, I came from the programmatic space mm. and I sort of stumbled into affiliates and I was like wow this is manual like there's a lot of manual stuff like all of that is like yeah. should be automated um, and I think you know it became a bit of an obsession um, around 2012 I guess um, to try and automate things uh, which I thought should be automated so you and I I think both came from a this is not working properly. Yeah. Um, kind of, whereas you're kind of you two have seem to have more of a 
entrepreneurship in your, in your DNA. Are you trying to say you two are more pure than we are in some way? Better looking. I mean, I couldn't, I, money was not my intention because I had no idea if it's going to work out. I was unprofitable for at least three, four years, you know, so that was... I actually think that's very cool. Yeah. You agree? <laughs> and it says a lot about your determination and your ability to think big, which is actually very cool. And it's Thanks. actually quite rare, I think, in the UK and Europe, so really hats off to you for that. Because it's something I've learned over time, and I've spent some time in the US, uh, in Silicon Valley, and you can't help but pick it up there. And it's really something I feel now, but it's something I've had to learn slowly. But the fact that you've already got it, you know, kudos to your family and your parents, but also to yourself for having a gumption. Well done. Thanks, I agree. yeah. Round of applause for Sabrina. Uh, <laughs> so, what's scary? Speaking, speaking of that, um, I, I, this is something I think that's um, quite, quite interesting. I, um, um, I come from a, I, I'm not UK born and raised, I come from a slightly different culture where it seems to be kind of okay to fail, you know. Um, I think in my culture, no one sort of, you know, particularly looks down on you. Yeah. You've had like, you know, some sort of, you know, previous failure in life. But I feel that like, potentially this is something that's quite cultural specific or cultural sensitive. When you did that, were you scared of failure? Like, was that something that like, you know, yeah. bothered you whether or not you were gonna, you were gonna fail? Absolutely. I'm, I can honestly say to this day, I'm absolutely terrified of failure. That's what mm. keeps me going, I think. Yeah. But again, maybe it's a different, you know, people start businesses for different reasons. But I would say, I don't know if it's a UK thing, but certainly that's what keeps me awake at night is fear of failure. I think it's quite interesting in the UK, the psyche is very much, I think it's changing and I hope it's changing. You'd have to ask someone so younger too. than me uh, if it's okay to fail. I think it is slowly changing. But for me and probably fair few people in the crowd here, it's not okay to fail. It's not actually, it's not acceptable to fail. It's not, it's uh, not perceived as acceptable. Oh, totally not. Whereas, you know, in countries, in my opinion, like Israel, America, particularly West Coast, it's totally fine. It's actually applauded. And I'd like to see that come up here because then you have people willing to take a chance. I mean, and being frank, I was scared shitless. I was in a career path that was, you know, frankly doing really well where I was and I quit my job. I took all the money I had, my life savings, which was 25,000 pounds. I borrowed money, 100,000 pounds, because back then you could get this. You could borrow money on credit cards, uh, free with no fees for 12 months. So I borrowed 100,000 pounds on credit cards and added that to my 25, borrowed 50K from my dad. And I went, I got 175K to play with. Shri, that's amazing. Uh, oh my God. I didn't know that, that's incredible. And I'm just saying that you, I, I was shit scared because it's not okay to fail. Um, but I'd like it that, you know, I hope some of you, if you're ever thinking about business, be afraid, but you don't worry about what other people think, you know, live your own life, give it a go. You can always fall back to what you did before. I agree. Amazing, amazing, Shri. I, yeah. I didn't know that, by the way. Well done. Scary. Oh, Shri as well, I think. I mean, yeah, according to my mom, I'm kind of, I was a failure when I... <laughs> You know, uh, for her, like just the fact that she didn't understood what I'm doing, uh, didn't understand, sorry, didn't understand German, didn't understand what I'm doing, um, was a little bit disappointing to her because, you know, she, I'm coming from a culture where... I don't think my, my parents still understand what I'm doing right now. Yeah. <laughs> I tried explaining it to my mom last week. She, it, didn't, it didn't stick. Yeah, and it, I mean, my mom told me, because I, I was kind of offended that she still didn't get it. And then she said, well, why can't you do something like your cousins? Be a doctor, be a lawyer, be a, you know, something that I can explain. And it kind of, it, it just, it felt weird. But um, for me, there was no option actually to fail because I left uh, my hometown. I left my family to go to Berlin, the, the startup hub, to start the company because it's way cheaper there. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Where are you from originally, Sabrina? From Munich. So, the expensive city in Germany. <laughs> Can I just add as well, I think, and this is probably true for all of us, although I've, in terms of fear of failure, that's really strong in me. I think culturally, what we've always tried to do, and I'm sure it's the same with you guys, is take that away internally from the company. So, encouraging failure is actually quite an important thing, is that no one likes to fail, but if you're not trying things as a company and setting yourself up for potential failure, then you don't move forward, do you? So it's, 100%. We, so it's something we try and it's within us, but we try and solve it, I think, in a cultural I, sense. I, I think that it's about, um, it's about intelligent risk taking. 
um, in, in the sense that um, I, I, I'm not a gambler. I don't gamble. I, I don't understand gambling. But I am a risk taker, and I have taken calculated risks all of my life. Um, and I think encouraging calculated risks where someone can explain to you, I think we should do this. I think it's ballsy, but I think we should do this because if we succeed, then X, Y, Z is, is a really good thing to do culturally. And I think, um, yeah, I, I really do wish that there was um, less of a, uh, you know, that, that sort of a fear of, of failure would be less of an inhibitor because there's so much talent um, in, our, in this country, in this city, in this industry, you know, um, and I think once you lift, you know, and you start thinking in terms of calculated risk, and it's okay, if you've taken a calculated risk and you failed, it's okay, you know, I think potential can get unleashed. But I think we don't stop failing. I mean, I'm not that, I think in leadership, for example, sometimes I'm failing, I'm failing people, you know, sometimes I even fail some clients because I over promised something and couldn't deliver. So this constantly happens. Uh, it's a learning curve, especially leading people also. Yeah. I was just going to add that, you know, sometimes people, I think, make the assumption that you've just got to be a super confident person to be able to do something and start a business and all that. But I hope you can kind of see that you, you can be just who you are and you can still muddle through. Because quite frankly, I bet if you asked each of us, how did you figure out the next few steps, they'll go, I don't know. I just figured out the next two steps and then, I don't know, I just did the next two steps. So, you know, there's no one way that you have to be to make something happen. You just have to be yourself, but then you have to find the, the courage somehow. And I think, I call it having a plan B. Um, I had a plan B. If I didn't make my first business work, I actually had a plan B. I already had acceptance at a university to study uh, something else, was, which was one of my interests in a completely different field, and I deferred it for a year. So I had a plan B. So, you know, that, can, that gave me a sense of safety um, while still taking risk. Fantastic. Um, so in all of your sort of career paths as entrepreneurs, you, you know, and I think we, uh, we will all agree that one thing about being an entrepreneur is there's, there are big highs and big lows, right? The highs can be phenomenally high and the lows can be phenomenally low. Um, and, um, you know, some of the obstacles can seem at time insurmountable, you know, um, looking back at sort of your path in the last six, seven years, what would you single out as being perhaps, you know, the toughest hurdle that you had to overcome the, the biggest lesson you've had to learn in order to make your business successful? Well, that's easy. Um, where should I start? So, uh, I think. You know, when I started, I thought, man, I'm cool and everyone would like to work with me. So I'm going to have pretty cool people around me that are equally as cool and we're going to do some cool shit, you know? <laughs> and I think the one thing I learned is that a lot of people didn't think that I was so cool. <laughs> uh, they found out I was actually not like on their vibe. And um, I think the biggest learning was definitely to find my tribe, you know, the team and the people that understand how I worked. Also, I took a lot of, I, it took me a lot of time to understand and to create a sense of, you know, to feel people's energy, you know, in the company, in the team. And so you mean like create like, like a culture? Yes, within the company? to create a culture, exactly. And now I'm very big on culture, okay? I'm very big on culture. I'm the cultural, I am the culture in the company. Like, I'm the cultural ambassador in the company. So, yeah, I had to learn that, definitely. I think probably mine would be, and increasingly was, um, getting, you may have heard this term, getting product market fit. Because we were doing something new and with our product, it's very clear if it's going to add revenue to the, to the advertiser. And if it doesn't, you're toast. And so we had a hunch that it was going to do that. But just working through all the nuances and the complexities, because it's not a, a platform that people access in both places, sides, and it's a marketplace, and which is there you go, the product works, and use the interface. It's not. Ours is one where it uses machine learning to try and boost revenue. And if it doesn't boost revenue, we're toast. Um, 
And I had to sit with that risk and tweaking dials and turning knobs um, for, you know, frankly, two and a bit years trying to do that. And then we started seeing success. And I think that was the hardest part. And there was a lot of, frankly, sleepless nights uh, working through that. Right, it's a tough question, that. Um, I think... I've got, I've got some more. Oh, God. I, th I, think, I think Sabrina's was the correct answer. It's like, it's, all, it's always about the people and how you recruit and, and how you build that team. We did a lot around that. Um, but rather than just repeat Sabrina's answer, I think that one of the challenges we've grappled with a bit over the last few years has been the, um, the sort of change from being a very opportunistic business where it's been all about, oh, let's launch a poker site this week or a bingo site this week or whatever it is, to be more of a strategic business where we're trying to think about longer-term goals and recruit with longer-term goals in mind and build a business that scales. And that's actually, I find that quite difficult because I kind of, you know, you come to an event like this and I'll go back with 60 really, really good ideas, well, you know, good ideas in my mind. And then there's lots of people at Genie already doing jobs and I'll go back to them and say, let's do this because I've seen someone else doing it and I'll get in people's way. And that, you know, it's something it's not very. You need good advisors working with you, like good, good, good people to sort of help, like streamline your ideas, right? I, if people at Genie are very good at saying no to me, it's fine. It's, it works all right. <laughs> but equally, you don't want to take that away, right? You can't stop being opportunistic. So I, I don't think we've got there yet. But I think that's an interesting balance that we need to strike as we grow. I love this because again, you've you've actually uh, um, pointed out three very different challenges. Yours was um, uh, culture, team building yeah. and culture. Yours was product, and yours was strategy. And actually, mine was sales. I, I was terrible at sales when I started the business. Like, I had no idea how to do it. <laughs> and um, I would go on calls and, like, stutter and flop, and I didn't know what to focus on, and it was awful. And then I basically had to teach myself how to do sales properly, because, well, I had to. Um, but I think once we... Once I sort of got that right, it became a lot easier to kind of, you know, template that and grow the business. But that yeah. was a huge obstacle for me. Like I would like flop calls one after the other, uh, you know, like have 10 meetings scheduled and like tank all of them. Um, it was pretty awful. Well, it's still pretty decent now. <laughs> I'm an Looking amazing back. salesperson now, Sabrina. <laughs> I've honed the art of sales. I'm a sales samurai. <laughs> we have questions. Oh, there's, yes, there's questions from the audience. I should have said that. You can ask uh, questions. Um, mm. I think I'm going to ask my question next, though. And then I'm going to... And then I'm yeah. Gonna, we, oh, do you know what? We only have five minutes, actually. So, okay, let's see. There's a question here. Looking at the near future, a couple of years from now, do you see any big disruptions around the corner that will affect our industry? I think um, just a couple of ideas that I've been kicking around that I think are really meaningful. One is um, live shopping has been a thing on TV in the old school world and is a big thing on the internet world in places like China and has been for five years. And I would predict in the next two and three years, you're going to see that start really kicking off here. Although already there is movement in that world, especially pro propelled by COVID. So I think live TV and that plays very much to this world because it's around influencers. So live shopping. The other one is um, with being able to purchase on the likes of Instagram and Facebook. Um, so Facebook shop, Instagram shop, you know, what I call the disintermediation of the retailer, which means buying on Instagram and Facebook. So how do you prepare yourself for that world? Right? Because in my opinion, and I kind of talk about this a fair bit, I think that could be 25% of retail uh, purchased right on Instagram or Facebook. Oh, the questions are piling up. Anyone else wants to answer that, that question about no. the future? I, I mean, Shri's answer is pretty amazing, <laughs> right? Like, I think he's, he's absolutely right. Um, 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 if you had to start over, oh, sorry, actually, where's the one? There was one about um, uh, the tip that you would give yourself, and it was deleted. The one tip. Oh, you deleted it. But anyway, yeah. the question which I thought was really good, which was if you would, could go back, right, or talk to, like, an aspiring entrepreneur in the crowd, what, what there? would be the top tip that you would give that person embarking on that journey? Sabrina. Oh, definitely, if you try to, let's say, solve a problem, you know, that exists, solve a problem, and if you are like me and you copied someone else's business, at least have some kick-ass USPs. Awesome advice. <laughs> Um, I, I'm at risk of stealing other people's answers again now, so kind of stealing Sri's answers from earlier on. 
coming maybe from more of the, yeah, the opportunistic side rather than the product side. I think it's really important to have some money coming in when you start a business. I think people put an awful lot of pressure on themselves. I see, you know, I know plenty of people who have done this. They quit their job, they start a business, and three months later they're not making any money and, and it's all going horribly wrong. I, that seems to me like a very all or nothing approach to starting a business. If you can do something in between, have some money coming in from whatever it is, a part-time job or consultancy, then you, you give yourself time. Because the one thing that's for sure is three months after you start a business, it's going to be a completely different business to what it was three months yeah. before. So you've got to give yourself time to do it, I think. Or just, you know, borrow a load of money, whichever way it is. At least you, gave, you bought yourself time. In yeah, effect, when you borrow it? money, people expect it back. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, oh, really? I'd probably add one. Um, I like this phrase called founder's faith. And really what it means is faith in yourself. If you're gonna go and try something, uh, what I realized for myself is that I can sit there being paranoid and worried, but instead I kind of went, I'm not gonna be worried for this length of time. So once you've decided, commit and say, and I would say to myself, just don't worry for this length of time and just have that peace of mind. So give yourself that bandwidth and that space. Hmm. I think this is all excellent advice. We're nearly out of time. I, I would um, add to that that um, if, you, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to ask yourself, am I a resilient person? Because it's really hard. Um, and I'm sure all of you have experienced it, but it's hard at times to the point where at least personally speaking, it can be, I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent. You know, so it could be that hard. So if you don't have that resilience in you, if you don't have that ability to uh, look at something really hard and kind of say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull through this, I'm going to be okay with this, um, then I wouldn't recommend you embark on that route. Um, it is because it is hard and you need to be a resilient person. But if you, if you are resilient, um, then uh, this could be an amazing experience because like I've said earlier, the highs are rarely matched by anything else that you would do, um, I think, as an employee. When as a business, you're able to raise your first round um, or you're able to close your first deal or you see the product that you've built live on another site that, that, that a very big company has uh, created. It's, it's, it has that adrenaline is next level. Um, I've got to add something. Just making our first 10,000 pounds is not that much money to a lot of people, but, um, but we were just elated. When we hit 10,000 per month, we were like, woohoo! And frankly, that to me was more meaningful than like us hitting our next month's number. Um, and probably I need to say as well, you know, there is some glamour in starting a business, but frankly, most of it, analogy, it's like shoveling coal. It really is, trust me. You do your dog's body, you do a bit of everything. So there is a lot of grinding it out that you have to be willing to do. But then you have those little moments like the 10K. Hmm. Well, we're out of time. Um, so um, we need to finish. I don't think we have time for any more questions, but thank you very much. Have fun um, on the deck. Thank you, the three of you, you've been amazing. Thanks for listening.